In order to understand the mode of existence of such objective intellectual manifestations, we have to place them within the specific framework of our categories for interpreting the world. The discrepant relationship between objective and subjective culture, which forms our specific problem, will then find its proper place within these categories. The Platonic myth implied that the soul had seen the pure essence, the absolute significance, of worldly objects during its pre-existence, so that the subsequent knowledge of it is but a remembrance of this truth emerging through sensory stimuli. The prime motive underlying this myth is the perplexity as to the origins of our knowledge if one denies its origin, as Plato does, in experience. However, this metaphysical speculation, aside from the specific cause of its emergence, basically indicates an epistemological attitude of the mind. Whether we interpret our cognition as a direct result of external objects or as a purely internal process in which everything external is an imminent form or relationship of mental elements, we always conceive of our thought to the extent that it is accepted as the truth as the fulfillment of an objective demand, the reproduction of an imaginary model. Even if our cognition were an exact reflection of the objects as they are in themselves, the unity, correctness and completeness that knowledge approaches by mastering one thing after another would not derive from the objects themselves. Rather, our epistemological ideal would always be their content in the form of ideas, since even the most extreme realism wishes to gain not the objects themselves but rather knowledge of them. If we describe the sum total of fragments that make up our knowledge at any one moment in relation to the goal we want to attain and which determines the significance of each stage, then we can do so only by presupposing that which lies at the basis of the Platonic doctrine, that there is an ideal realm of theoretical values, of perfect intellectual meaning and coherence, that coincides neither with the objects since these are only its objects nor with the psychologically real knowledge that has been attained. On the contrary, this real knowledge only gradually and always imperfectly approximates to that realm which includes all possible truth. It is true only in the sense that it is successful in doing this. Plato seems to have accepted this basic feeling that our knowledge at any moment is only a part of a complex of knowledge that exists only in an ideal form and invites and demands psychological realization on our part. Yet he expressed this as a decrease in real knowledge from the former grasp of this totality, as a no longer, instead of our present-day interpretation of it as a not yet. But the relationship itself can obviously be experienced in both interpretations as basically the same, just as the identical number may be derived by subtractions from a higher number or by addition of lower numbers. The mode of existence peculiar to this cognitive ideal that confronts our real cognitions as a norm, or as a totality, is the same as the totality of moral values and prescriptions that confront the actual behavior of individuals. Here, in the ethical realm, we are more aware of the fact that our behavior corresponds well or badly to an intrinsically valid norm. This norm, which may differ in its content for different people and for different periods of their lives is not to be found in time and space, nor does it coincide with moral awareness, which is instead conscious of being dependent upon that norm. Ultimately, the formula of our life as a whole, from the trivial practice of every day to the highest peak of intellectuality, is this, in all that we do, we have a norm, a standard, an ideally preconceived totality before us, which we try to transpose into reality through our actions. This refers not to the simple generalization that our will is guided by some kind of ideal, rather, it refers to the specific, more or less distinct, quality of our actions, which can only be described in the following way, in our action, regardless of whether it's value contradicts ideals, we follow some prefigured possibility and, as it were, carry out an ideal program. Our practical existence, though inadequate and fragmentary, gains a certain significance and coherence, as it were, by partaking in the realization of a totality. Our actions, even our total being, beautiful or ugly, right or wrong, great or petty, seem to be drawn from a wealth of possibilities such that, at every moment, they relate to its ideally determined content just as the concrete object relates to the concept that expresses its imminent law and its logical essence without the significance of this content thereby being dependent upon whether, how and how often it is realized. We cannot conceive of cognition in any other way except as the realization in our consciousness of those conceptions, which were, so to say, waiting to be conceived at that particular point in. Question. The fact that we term our knowledge necessary knowledge, that is that there is only one specific way in which its content can exist, 
is only a different expression of the conviction that we consider it to be the mental realization of the pre-established ideal content, this one specific way does not mean that there is only one truth for the great variety of minds. Rather, if on the one hand a definitely structured intellect and, on the other, a certain objective reality is given, the truth for this mind is objectively preformed in the same way as is the answer to a calculation if its factors are given. With every change in the endowed mental structure, the content of this truth changes, without being any the less objective or more dependent upon the awareness of this mind. The unswerving conclusion that we derived from certain facts of knowledge, that other facts of knowledge also have to be assumed, is the accidental cause that illustrates the nature of our comprehension, every single piece of knowledge means becoming aware of something that is already valid and established within the objectively determined context of the contents of knowledge. Finally, from the psychological point of view, this is associated with the theory according to which everything held to be true is a certain feeling which accompanies a mental image, what we call proof is nothing. Other than the establishment of a psychological constellation which gives rise to such a feeling. No sense perception or logical derivations can directly assure us of a reality. Rather, they are only the conditions that evoke the supertheoretical feeling of affirmation, of agreement or whatever one may call this rather indescribable sense of reality. It forms the psychological mediator between the two epistemological categories, between the valid purpose of things, brought forth by its inner coherence that assigns each element to its proper place, and our perception of things that signifies their reality for a human subject. The objectification of the mind this general and basic relationship is paralleled to a lesser extent in the relationship between the objectified mind and culture, and the individual. Just as, from an epistemological standpoint, we draw our life contents from a realm of objectively valid entities, so, viewed historically, we draw the major part of them from the stock of accumulated mental labor of the species. Here too we find preformed contents that are ready to be realized by individual minds but yet preserve their determinateness which does not coincide with that of a material object. For even where the mind is tied to matter, as in tools, works of art and books, it is never identical with that part of them that is perceptible to our senses. The mind lives in them in a hardly definable potential form which the individual consciousness is able to actualize. Objective culture is the historical presentation or more or less perfect condensation of an objectively valid truth which is reproduced by our cognition. If we can say that the law of gravity was valid before Newton formulated it, then the law itself does not rest in the substance of matter. Instead, it only illustrates the manner in which the relations of matter present themselves to a specifically organized mind, and the validity of the law is independent of the fact that matter exists in reality. If this is the case then the law resides neither in objective things themselves nor in the subjective mind, but in that sphere of the objective spirit which, stage by stage, is condensed into reality by our sense of truth. Once this has been accomplished by Newton with respect to the law in question, that law has been incorporated into the objective historical mind, and its ideal significance within that mind is now, in its turn, basically independent of its reproduction by particular individuals. By establishing this category of the objective mind as the historical manifestation of the valid intellectual content of things in general, it becomes clear how the cultural process that we recognize as a subjective development, the culture of things as a human culture, can be separated from its content. This content, by entering that category, acquires, as it were, another physical condition and thus provides the basis for the phenomenon of the separate development of objective and personal culture. The objectification of the mind provides the form that makes the conservation and accumulation of mental labor possible, it is the most significant and most far-reaching of the historical categories of mankind, for it transforms into a historical fact what is biologically so doubtful hereditary transmission.